I'll begin by uh, discussing uh, an article that really struck me uh, a few days ago. It was um, an article that appeared in the uh, Jerusalem Post in which um, several human rights organizations were asked to comment on why it was that none of them was asking for an investigation into Hamas war crimes in Gaza. And the response was one of the strangest things I've ever heard. It is, the crimes are so blatant. It was referring to one particular set of Hamas crimes. Hamas crimes of attacking civilian targets through rocket mortar, ta mortar attacks, attacking civilians in Israel, is so blatant that there's no need to investigate. On the other hand, the qu whether Israel in fact committed any crimes is dubious, and therefore there must be an investigation. Now, I, I think, thought that rather captured the failure to understand what their mission ought to be. That is, if the, their mission is to encourage accountability rather than to puzzle about curious intellectual puzzles, um, what they ought to be focusing on are clear and obvious war crimes. The intellectual puzzles are interesting, and of course, uh, in my other hat, I love dealing with them. Um, but it's not, I wouldn't think that that should be the focus of the efforts of the human rights organization to puzzle about um, items at the edge of what they think perhaps with a clever theory one could label as uh, criminal. So I want to have the, set the focus the way it would seem to me that the focus ought to be, which is let's focus on the clear things, and then at the end let's get to the things that are not so clear. Okay, so um, let me just start with what Hamas is. And the, the reason it's important is that actually the nature of the organization has a lot of legal implications. It has legal implications for targeting and has legal implications for other duties that apply to organizations of this kind. <coughs> all right, so um, this is all from the charter of the organization. It was, the charter was written less than 21 years ago. This is not uh, 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 um, in the very distant past. And as we'll see as we go on, um, uh, the items that are here um, are quite shocking, and they're repeated uh, in these days as well, uh, suggesting that this is a very good summation of what the organization is. OK, um, um, it's an organization that quite explicitly talks about the need for the destruction of Israel. Um, it, is inter it is intending to do this through armed struggle. Um, and the armed struggle is not just against the state of Israel, but against the Jews as such, right? Our struggle against the Jews is very great and very serious. Um, uh, the day of judgment will not come about until Muslims fight the Jews, killing them. Um, and then it has a whole set of um, classic anti-Semitic descriptions of the enemy that would be me and other Jews um, that amass great wealth, control the world media, stir revolutions, um, form secret societies, etc. Um, they were behind World War I, they, the Jews, right, were behind World War I, obtained the Balfour Declaration, formed the League of Nations as part of this insidious plot, um, uh, made huge financial gains in trading and armaments. They, they all, they, these Jews tend to make lots of money through all kinds of nefarious activity. Right? But it's not simply making money. Their nefarious activity involves being behind every war everywhere. Um, um, they create all sorts of secret organizations like the Freemasons, and the Rotary Club, um, and um, um, they, they do all sorts of things that perhaps you may nev never have heard of previously because they weren't widely reported in the media, but uh, secretly Jews went up in 1967 and when they conquered Jerusalem they proclaimed that Muhammad is dead and all of his followers are women. Um, now, jihad is, of course, primarily about uh, the uh, uh, armed fighting against the Jews and the state of Israel in order to destroy it. But we have to understand that the Zionist influence is everywhere, including financial and media control, um, so that it's necessary to carry on jihad through other means as well. Um, and ultimately, um, it's... The, the aim of Hamas is peace. It's peace through subjugation. 
Right? So um, um, the Jews have to acknowledge the superiority of Islam. That is, they have to become Muslim. Right? They have to submit. If they um, if they fail to submit, then you know, um, judgment day. Now, uh, um, uh, Zionist Nazi activities are doomed to fail because Allah will not allow them to get to their end, and uh, there can be no compromise in this. No peace is possible. Right? Uh, any peace is contrary to the way Hamas understands its religious duty, which is fighting jihad until the end. All right, um, I wanted to share with you um, a few more current uh, uh, versions of this. This is not exactly... Um, this sort of material is not limited to the Charter. It still exists today. inside the in, in the Hamas Charter which talks about what is the end of all the Jews and the end of all the Jews of course in the day of judgment is all to be killed uh, with the help of the rocks and the trees <coughs> um, now um, in service of this uh, Hamas <coughs> has engaged in jihad here's just uh, an example I pulled from Wikipedia uh, suicide attacks that were carried out uh, during 2004, um, all aimed at civilian targets, as you can see. Um, uh, bo two border crossings, a, b a bus, a port, um, uh, as many as 16 uh, casualties. Um, all right, now, what does all this mean? Legal implications of this. Now, there's a, there's a convention out there called the, Prevent the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide. Article two defines genocide as um, any of the following acts committed with intent to destroy in whole or in part a national, ethnic, <coughs> racial, or religious group such as killing members of the group. Okay, so killing members of a group with an intent to destroy the group in whole or in part, so long as the group is a religious or ethnic group, is an act of genocide. And so we have <coughs> killing, we have a declared intent to destroy the group in whole or in part. It is an ethnic or religious group. Therefore, Article 2 says an act of genocide. Um, Article 3 says, uh, defines various crimes associated with genocide, and they include not only the act of genocide itself, but also the incitement to genocide, um, such as calling on uh, um, followers of Hamas to engage in killings of any kind in service of the goal of destroying the group in whole and part. Um, and state parties undertake to prevent and punish this. That is, st all state parties to um, uh, the Genocide Convention are required to prevent and punish Hamas activities. Um, incidentally, this uh, convention is generally considered to have been incorporated in customary law such that even if a state has not signed on the, on the convention. It is considered to be bound by it anyway. And the convention is generally considered to be something called jus cogens, which means something that a portion of international law from which no state can ever excuse itself. It may never a, a, a extract itself from the duty. Um, now, there's another important implication of this, and this has to do with targeting, which we'll get to a little bit later. but. Um, when you look at uh, uh, the question of what targets were legitimate for Israel during the fighting with Hamas, there are a number of uh, cases having to do with targeting 
items that have to do with inciting genocide. So there are a number of cases in the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda that discussed uh, targeting uh, television stations. They were seen as legitimate targets. And, and in cases of the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, they discussed this again when NATO forces targeted television stations uh, in Kosovo and in Yugoslavia, the um, television and radio stations, um, the prosecutor said uh, we would have to discuss whether they were used for communications uh, assisting the military because there was no call to genocide. If there had, obviously they would have been good targets. And so the fact that uh, any Hamas installation that is used for the activity of inciting to genocide or preparing to, for genocide, etc., is a legitimate target. Um, now, there's another important uh, implica legal implication of what Hamas is, and that has to do with whether it's a terrorist organization and what the results of that are. So, if you look at what is a terrorist uh, organization, um, it's an organization that um, willfully carries out acts intended to cause death or serious bodily injuries to civilians or other persons not taking active part in the hostilities, where the purpose of such act is to intimidate a population or compel a government or an international organization to do or abstain from doing something. Uh, that pretty clearly covers the activities of Hamas. Um, as a result, any signatory on the International Convention on Suppression of Financing of Terrorism is obliged um, to take certain acts to prevent money from going to them. I'll just note that the persons who are committed, considered terrorists are not solely those who carry out these acts of killing, but those who participate or, or, or are accomplices in it, those who organize or direct others, uh, those who contribute in various ways. Okay, now, um, there is a legal duty binding on all states, even if they're not members of that convention. It's uh, created by Security Council Resolution 1373, which was adopted on by authority of Chapter 7, which, mean, which means that every state is required to carry it out by order of the Security Council. And um, the Security Council required all states to prevent and suppress the financing of terrorist acts and do various other things, including deny safe haven to those who finance, plan, support, or commit terrorist acts, or provide safe havens. Right. Um, <coughs> Incidentally, when it talks here about support, it's quite clear it's providing any form of support, active or passive. Right, so um, even passive support to terrorist organizations is forbidden. Um, 1566, 1566 has one important clarification, that there is no excuse by reason of uh, uh, political agenda. Right? Um, you go down here to the bottom. Um, under no circumstances, circumstances justifiable by uh, considerations of political, philosophical, ideological, racial, ethnic, religious, or other similar nature. And so the, the duties created by the Security Council, this also, by the way, is a Chapter 7 resolution, um, cannot be waived simply because uh, Hamas has a political <laughs> agenda. I'll add, by the way, you'll look, you'll look throughout these these uh, uh, documents, 1373, 1566, the International Convention for the Suppression of uh, Terrorist Financing, um, other documents like the International Convention for the Suppression of Terrorist Bombings, the, the Genocide Convention, all the others. Is there any clause that says a popularly elected party is exempt from the provisions of these treaties? And the answer, of course, is no. Right? Uh, winning an election does not mean you may commit genocide, commit terrorism, or, and otherwise avoid uh, legal responsibility. Okay, um, let's talk about how it is that the fighting in Gaza started. Um, so this is the standard um, uh, claim about the fighting in Gaza. The fighting in Gaza started on uh, Saturday, December 27th, when Israel launched a wave of air and missile attacks and targets across Gaza. Now, unfortunately, someone f forgot to send this memo to Hamas because Hamas inconveniently, um, more than a week beforehand, announced that it was launching an attack on Israel. And, um, so on December, uh, um, uh, December 19th, um, actually it was December 18th, 
Uh, Hamas announced that it was ending its so-called ceasefire with Israel. Um, they described uh, what it was that they intended to do several days later. Um, they intended to um, there it is. enlarge the oil stain operation. This was um, um, uh, their offensive against Israel. Um, to get thousands of Israelis under fire. Now, December 24th, December 27th, December 24th comes before December 27th, right? Usually. Not on the, not on the BBC. Okay. Um, the general law of the initiation of the use of force. Um, now, it's not clear, that, by the way, that any of this applies. If Gaza is not a state, then there's no law forbidding um, anyone, either side, in fact, from uh, initiating the use of force. Um, if Gaza is a state, then Article 2.4 states that states may not use military force against other states, um, against the territorial integrity of other states or political independence, except for Article 51, self-defense. Now, um, uh, that would mean that if Gaza is a state, uh, Israel has a right under uh, Article 51 to counterattack, um, if, and Gaza would not have had the right under Article 24 to, to attack to begin with. But if it's not a state, then of course none of this applies. All right. Um, now let's move on to crimes of distinction. There are a few basic rules that apply um, in the laws of war, irrespective of whether it's an international or non-international armed conflict. One of these is the rules of distinction. Um, attacks must be aimed at military objects and not at civilian objects. Um, we'll skip this one. We'll just. Uh, um, it's pretty 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 clear that uh, Hamas's attacks on uh, uh, civilians in Israel through rocket and uh, mortar are blatant war crimes, as uh, we saw at the beginning. Um, that's the reason, of course, human rights groups don't need to talk about it, because it's so obviously uh, criminal. Um, civilian shielding. There, is, uh, uh, provisions, there are provisions in customary law having to do with the use of civilian shields. They also find their way into some conventions. Um, the, the convention here uh, that I'm citing doesn't, I do not think, applies to this particular conflict, although um, it's questionable. Um, whether it does or not, the, the rule remains the same. The, protection, the presence of a protected person, in this case civilians, cannot be used to render certain points of areas or areas immune from military operations, meaning it is, a, it is forbidden to attempt to use a civilian to shield a target. Now, um, here is uh, um, uh, a story from <coughs> New York Times. Uh, Hamas is asking civilians to stand at the roofs of buildings so Israeli pilots will not bomb. There's a nice picture of it. Um, you can see, in a very blurry fashion, hundreds of, of uh, civilians standing on the roof of a building in order to protect it. Um, here are various other stories. Uh, Der Spiegel has a story about um, uh, uh, various homes that were taken over by Hamas uh, to attack Israeli troops, um, and the um, and the uh, uh, anger of Gaza residents. Um, crimes of perfidy. Right. The, this again is a, um, um, a convention that doesn't apply to this particular war, but. Uh, the definition of what is perfidy is a pretty good one, so uh, we'll refer to it. It is prohibited to um, encourage, invite the confidence of an adversary to believe that someone is entitled to protection under the laws, the rules of international law, with the intent to portray that confidence. These are examples of perfidy, pretending to be a civilian, pretending to be protected by, for example, using uniforms of the, or emblems of the UN or other neutrals or medical personnel. Okay, so um, it was fairly well, widely reported that Hamas fighters did not wear uniforms. They dressed themselves as civilians. Here are two cases. Uh, Hamas militants fighting in civilian clothes. Uh, eight Hamas uh, fighters dressed in civilian clothes found dead. Um, um, we have uh, reports of Hamas fighters using hospitals as cover. Right? 
and Hamas militants in civilian clothes roaming the halls. Um, uh, Muhammad here uh, giving, I, I presume that's not his real name, uh, describing his uh, joy at uh, joining uh, Hamas and uh, describing their methods of fighting, including wearing civilian clothes and concealing their weapons. Um, here's a civilian dressed man loading up a rocket. Um, there's endless numbers of, uh, of these reports that are available. Um, here you can, well, I guess you can't see it very well. If you look over there, you can see the gun. Um, and this is a, that's an ambulance. Um, you also have reports. You have the Nazis, by the way. I, I, I'm deliberately trying to avoid using Israeli papers here. Um, Sydney Morning Herald uh, describing Hamas uh, activities to hijack ambulances and use them to ferry troops around. Right. Um, so numerous acts of, uh, of perfidy. Um, interference with humanitarian supply. Um, again, this is a convention that does not apply, but it provides a reasonable summation of some customary law on the subject. It is forbidden for, uh, uh, for parties while fighting to deliberately attack humanitarian supplies as such. Right? Parties to the conflict shall in no way divert the relief consignments except in cases of urgent necessity. Right? Um, uh, there's a different uh, uh, provision in um, Article 14 of, of Protocol 2, another convention that doesn't apply but uh, is relevant. Uh, prohibited to attack, destroy, or remove, or render useless for that purpose objects indispensable to survival of the civilian population, such as foodstuffs. Right. Um, but nevertheless, uh, Hamas has uh, raided air trucks, uh, aid trucks, um, stolen the supplies. Um, uh, it's stolen them directly out of warehouses. Now, all of this is important in addition because, if you'll recall, we said at the beginning Hamas is a terrorist organization to which the duties of Security Council Resolution 1373 apply. It is forbidden to permit even passive support to a terrorist organization. That means that so long as this is the case, it is forbidden to provide aid under these circumstances. This is why, for example, UNRWA belatedly stopped distributing aid in Gaza. It stopped distributing aid in Gaza after this event. It is because, again, it is forbidden to provide aid in the circumstance in which the aid will be providing passive support to a terrorist organization. All right, um, last item, the use of uh, uh, children as shields. Um, besides a general duty not to use civilians as shields, there is a particular duty uh, not to uh, use civil as children, either as combatants or shields. Now, I have to say, here it's not entirely clear the degree to which this uh, duty applies to Hamas. It is not a state. Um, but um, uh, here's the general duty in one, um, in one summation. Right? Parties to a conflict shall take all feasible measures um, in order that children not reach the age of 15, don't take direct part in hostilities. Um, here are various pictures of uh, Hamas fighters surrounded by children as they carry on their activities. Um, this is a great uh, story about uh, uh, teaching uh, children in summer camps that they ought to be participating in hostilities, although that uh, rocket there is made out of plastic. Um, and um, I think at that uh, we can move on to the other side of the uh, picture, the alleged Israeli war crimes, war crimes in Gaza, because the casualty counts are very high on the Palestinian side. They're not high on the Israeli side. That must mean that Israel is committing a war crime. Now the question is, what's the war crime? The war crime they'll talk about um, uh, is generally something like disproportionality. Now, we, we talk, did we talk about the rule of disproportionality? No, we haven't, so this is a good time to mention it. Um, the law of uh, disproportionality, or proportionality, um, is another customary rule that states that when attacking legitimate military objectives, 
we'll have to talk in a moment about what military objective, legitimate military objectives there are. But when attacking legitimate military objectives, it is permissible to cause collateral damage to civilians so long as that damage is proportionate to military necessity. Now, um, let me give you an example of that. Now here's, um, um, after the uh, war in Kosovo, there were a number of complaints that were launched with the prosecutor for the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, um, accusing NATO forces of committing crimes of lack of distinction and disproportionality in their use of force against Yugoslavia, the former Yugoslavia, or Serbia, whatever you'd like to call it. Um, and here's a great example of the way the rule of proportionality works in combat. Okay, uh, one of the accusations that was made was that um, the NATO forces had improperly targeted a, broadcast, a TV and radio broadcast station. Now, the facts about this are more or less clear that NATO forces bombed this station. They bombed it deliberately. Um, the, there's some doubt over the exact casualty figures, but it says here between 10 and 17 people, all civilians, were estimated to be killed. And there are two questions. Was this a military objective? Was it a proper target? And then, if it was, um, was the damage to civilians, the 10 to 17 dead, for getting the, the, um, the station out of operation for no more than a few hours? Right? Let me just say, look at this here. NATO realized that attacking the RTS building would have only interrupt broadcasting for a brief period and indeed broadcasting allegedly recommenced within a few hours. Okay, so assuming that the television station was a legitimate military target and the military necessity was to knock it out of operation for a few hours, was the damage here, 10 to 17 civilians dead, proportionate to military necessity? And the prosecutor said, oh, that, well, that part's easy. Um, Assuming the station was a legitimate objective, the civilian casualties were unfortunately high, but do not appear to be clearly disproportionate. Easy case, right? Not clearly disproportionate to kill, again, 10 to 17 civilians to knock out a station for three hours. Right? Um, all right, so that's what, that's what uh, um, uh, the way proportionality is applied in cases outside of here. Um, now, what are the fi figures? Um, let, let me just uh, add one more thing. Um, uh, what about the fact that? Uh, How do you measure something like that? Just out of your report. You know, there's what, what's, what's there's, the a, there's a there's a great kind of there's a great Justice Scalia line about balancing tests, which is that a lot of these balancing tests involve measuring whether a rope is longer than a rock is heavy, and that's exactly what you're supposed to do here. You're tr supposed to measure incommensurate <coughs> things. I don't know how one measures the value of a civilian human life and compares it on a scale to military necessity. All I can tell you is that the powers that be out there in applying this think that 10 to 17 dead civilians is clearly, a, clearly proportionate when you're talking about knocking a station out for three hours. Now, if we compare military necessity of TV, knocking out stations for three hours and numbers of casualties, I think you'll get to, um, it'll be hard to find any case of an Israeli attack in Gaza that even gets close to that. Um, that high a civilian casualty rate for that small a target. Um, uh, I, I also wanted to mention some items about um, general um, uh, figures. And so if we look, for example, in the first Gulf War, I'm not aware in the first Gulf War of anyone having been prosecuted for crimes <coughs> of disproportionality for this, nor could they be. Um, here are the figures. Right? Kuwaiti casualties, Kuwaiti dead, 605. Iraqi, between 20,000 and 200,000. It's not, the, the figures, this huge range of figures here is something you should be familiar with, with from our context as well. The Iraqis report 200,000 dead. Um, uh, U.S. reports were initially 15,000 and then went up to about 20,000. 
Um, and most sources say something around between 20 and 25, but the Iraqi figure is, uh, is still out there. By, by the way, if you look at the Israeli numbers in, in Gaza, uh, has anybody seen numbers for casualties? What numbers have you seen? 1,300. Now, does anybody know where that number is? This is the number. 1,300 is the number used in almost every report and by the UN. Where does it come from? It comes from the Palestinian Health Ministry in Gaza. Now, who is the, who is the Palestinian Health Ministry in Gaza? Hamas. Hamas. Okay, so we've got Hamas figures out there that say there are 1,300 dead. They also say that there were um, 48 Hamas fighters that died and 49 Israeli soldiers that died. Uh, of course, this 48 to 49 has nothing to do with convenience in describing the mighty Hamas fighting force, nor does this low figure of 48 in any way reflect a desire to make it that it, it, to paint Israel as having attacked uh, civilians. Now, there's a different number that's out there that you haven't seen almost anywhere. Right, because it's the Israeli number. Um, and it is roughly 700 dead, of which approximately 500 were Hamas fighters. Okay. Now, um, I. Pardon? You can, look at, you can look at the names of the dead. Although, I, you know, for obvious reasons, Israel has chosen not to uh, share with us its intelligence and various things having to do with uh, Hamas. Um, now, you know, again, all these numbers here are, are a little bit fuzzy. Any one of these, 605, 20,000 to 200,000, all I can tell you is that when you hear a number out there that says 1,300, the UN reports 1,300 dead, you're hearing the same kind of number you heard in Lebanon, where the UN reported 1,100 dead, it reported 1,100 dead because that's what the Lebanese government told it. The Lebanese government reported 1,100 dead because that's what Hezbollah told it. Right. Yes? Are you aware of the uh, report by uh, Lorenzo Cremonese and Corriere? Yes. And so um, that's, there's, a, there's a, an Italian paper um, which reported no more than 600 dead. Um, he he gave, arrived at this figure by going around uh, Gaza hospitals. What's interesting is that that was attacked by both Hamas and Israel. Israel said that that figure sounds too low. Hamas obviously said that the figure was too low. Um, but then if you want to, the only independent numbers that are out there are those. Right? So you have three reports out there, 600, 700, 1300. Um, let me just move on to um, what are uh, legitimate targets. I see we're sort of declining anyway into the questions. I'll just go through this, and then uh, uh, um, you raise the things that interest you. Um, there's not a lot of good material on there out there on what constitutes uh, a valid military objective. But here's, here's one. The ICRC put together this list um, at some point to describe what are <coughs> military objectives. And remember, military objectives can always be attacked. Um, if the, even if there were, even if they're expected to cause, by the way, civilian casualties, so long as the civilian casualties are proportionate to the military necessity. Okay, now, here's the <coughs> okay, um, positions, installations, or constructions occupied by the forces indicated above, which is armed forces, including auxiliary and complementary organizations, um, and it includes. Um, uh, here, installation, instructions, and other works of military nature, and other organs for the direction and administration of military operations. This includes ministries. Um, there are other items. Industries of fundamental importance for the conduct of war. Industries for the manufacture of armaments, such as weapons. Uh, factories or plant constituting other production, etc. Um, Installations constituting research centers for experiments and development of weapons. Um, and of course, lines and means of communications, right, which includes roads, bridges, tunnels. Now, um, you go through the, uh, the um, alleged crimes. You have crimes such as targeting a university. Israel targeted a laboratory in a university which it claimed is being used to produce 
Qassam rockets and to engage in research about such rockets. Legitimate target? Well, um, yes. Right? Um, now, what happens if it turns out after the fact that Israel was incorrect in its intelligence? Does that mean that retroactively it becomes a war crime? And the answer is no. What is forbidden is to aim at civilians as such. Right? If one aims at a military target and one's wrong about it, then one has aimed properly. It's, it's, it is an un, a, a very unfortunate result, but that does not make it a crime. And by the way, that's the reason why the prosecutor in uh, this case recommended that all the charges against NATO forces be dropped. There were a number of cases in which it was quite clear after the fact that NATO forces had bombed civilians. They bombed a, a, um, a convoy of civilians as escaping the fighting. They bombed a train uh, that was con that contained apparently only civilians. Um, and there were a number of these cases where it turned out after the fact NATO intelligence was absolutely wrong. Um, and what's interesting, by the way, about those cases is that one of the claims was, well, NATO, fo NATO forces <coughs> should have been flying lower so that they could identify better the nature of the targets they were bombing. And the prosecutor said, no, it is not necessary to, to endanger NATO forces in order to gather better intelligence. Right? It is uh, legitimate on the basis of the intelligence they have to bomb these targets um, without a necessity to endanger anyone to get better intelligence. So um, um, if it turns out that Israel was wrong about the uh, university, right? or if it turns out that it was wrong about bombing mosques in which it believed um, uh, weapons were stored, or Hamas fighters were hiding, um, or schools in which Hamas uh, fighters were hiding, or, all, or UN installations in which they believed Hamas, uh, Hamas fighters were fighting, or ambulances in which it appeared to them that they were Hamas fighters that, were, um, that had commandeered. Again, these may all be tragic mistakes, but they're not war crimes. They're not war crimes because it is, it is a question of what Israel thought it was aiming at. And Israel's duty is to work with the intelligence that it has and can gather without endangering itself. Okay, all right, let me uh, leave it at that and uh, take whatever questions, observations, demands you have. Yeah. Uh, who is it that can I just ask you, if you to give me your name so that I, just, I know whom I'm, to whom I'm speaking? Joseph Newdorfer. Joseph Newdorfer. Newdorfer. Uh, who is it that published the final report? Uh, um, this is the prosecutor by the committee. Uh, this is the committee established to review the NATO bombing campaign um, by the um, prosecutor to the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. That was set up by um, by the, the UN Security Council following the fighting in Kosovo. And it's one of an, a handful of specialized tribunals that were set up to prosecute war crimes under international law. There have been very few of them in throughout history, and it's one of the few. Yes, could I have your name, please? Um, Kate Halpern. Okay. Two quick questions. One about the proving your intelligence. If your yes. intelligence turns out wrong, yes. then you go back and just show the jury, whoever it is, what you had? Because it's easy enough to say, well, I thought it was a, a weapons hold, but and then say Well, there... There isn't likely to be a jury here. Right, right? whatever. I've um, and there's there's an interesting question about whether um, whether it would make sense for states to show their intelligence to um, um, <coughs> other actors. But I, I think we have, what we have to remember in all these cases is on whom the burden of proof lies. The burden of proof, and this is in all criminal cases in domestic and international law, lies on the prosecution. Now. Um, some in, in some cases, it's fairly easy to prove targeting. Right? Hamas makes no bones about what it's targeting. Um, in this case, I think it would be very difficult for a prosecutor to prove that um, Israel is targeting civilians as such. That's probably because Israel is not sort of targeting civilians as such. And so it makes it rather difficult to prove a non-existent fact. And several times you mentioned states, but whether or not Hamas is a state. Right. So what, what difference does it make that Hamas is not a state? Where do these duties come from? 
Right? So I, I mentioned all, all these sources when I went back here, something like this. Protocol 1. Protocol 1 is a, is, a, is a document, it's a treaty that binds those states that are signed on it. By the way, Israel's not signed on it, so it's not bound by Protocol 1 either. Right? Um, so any duties wouldn't come from these documents per se, they would come from customary international law. What is customary international law? It's the law that um, states carry out um, under the impression that they're required to by international law. Now, does customary international law bind non-state parties? Um, and generally the answer would be no. For some reason, and I'm not entirely sure why, um, the convention is, I, I've never seen uh, any source to the contrary. And I've seen several sources that say yes, that in fighting, in combat, both sides, whether even if one is not a state, are bound by the rules of law. And um, non-state fighters can be prosecuted for war crimes. The general theory is that because the states are required to ensure that the laws of war are abided by, they are required to ensure that the other side abides by them as well. Right? So that Israel has a duty to ensure that Hamas abide by the laws of war. And incidentally, the other states of the world have the same duty. <coughs> War crime tribunals. War crime trials. So, what's the name, please? My name Elliot. 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 Uh, now, in, in Yugoslavia, you would call it the. Uh, there's another question, if, if, if you like, about the uh, militias in Bosnia. There are several militias in Bosnia Serbian, Croatian, and Muslim. And uh, they all committed uh, massacres, all of them. And uh, but they're not states, or, or there's a question as to whether they are states. So you can really re so there's the, the and they were all prosecuted. They were prosecuted. Yes. So then all the, the the militia fighters were all prosecuted. So why not from us? The militia uh, yes. terrorists. Yeah. Uh, David Lazar. Now all these things were written back in 1949. No, that, no, they're actually not. The, the, the protocols were written in later in the 70s. Um, um, and again, it's not the treaties here that are binding. It's the customary law that's binding. But, but, yes. but the thing is, is they were all written for what I understand is symmetrical warfare, but not, not asymmetrical warfare. Yes. There's nothing mentioning that you're fighting against a group urban warfare. It's probably not mentioned in these types of things. Well, urban warfare is definitely contemplated. Warfare. Urban warfare took place, uh, there was urban warfare in World War II, yeah. and it's definitely something that was contemplated in the law person who has endorsed a, quote, right uh, to resist. Now, a, a right to resist is both irrelevant and incorrect. Now, let me start with why it's irrelevant. Okay. Let's say that Hamas has a right to resist. Um, does that give it the right to commit war crimes? Well, no, and especially that's clarified after Security Council Resolution 1566, right? Terrorism cannot ju be justified by um, uh, reasons of an ideological, political, et cetera, et cetera, nature. Right? Um, so that um, not only would they have not have a right to commit war crimes, other states still have to treat them as a terrorist organization even if they have this alleged right to resist. Okay, now, there's a, 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 se there's a, a second item, which is the, the dubiousness of the right to resist itself, even if it should exist. Right? Uh, uh, sorry, even if it should do something, but it doesn't really help them anyway. Um, now, um, where would this right come from? Now, there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's an art, uh, there's an, uh, an argument by Oppenheim going back um, several decades about exactly this. And the argument was, it cannot be that there's a right to resist because they're not subject um, to any of the duties regarding beginning the use of force to begin with. Right? They have not, if you know the Hamas did it, then the question is, who in Hamas is responsible for it? And Hamas is notoriously vague about its chain of command. 
And so, um, so it would be um, not the easiest thing in the world to have a criminal suit of possibilities to try, try to bring these actions somewhere else in the world where the domestic courts are willing to entertain universal jurisdiction suits like Britain and Spain. Um, and then the question is really, what, was the li what is the likely disposition of the judge? And so, well, I can tell you of at least three Spanish judges, well, two, two Spanish judges that will readily entertain suits against Israelis. I can't think offhand of anyone who will entertain suits against Palestinians. Yes? Uh, my name is Yusuf Akimia. I, I was born in Iran and I grew up in Iran. Uh, one of the comments that you made, which got laughter from members of this audience, about Freemasons can spend. <laughs> yes. You know, I used to hear that. I used to read that in the papers in the 50s. Yes. The shots. One of the questions that I have is in, in Middle Eastern cultures, in, I know in Arabic and in Persian, the word for diplomacy is siyasat. Siyasat much better translates to deception rather than diplomacy. Okay, so we know you have put a lot of facts in front of us and it's very enlightening. What do we do when they lie and they fabricate stories and they invent <coughs> fantastic, I'm not fantastic in terms of quality, huge lies? What do you do? How do we combat that? Okay, so uh, let me just say one thing. I, I would prefer not to ascribe deception or lying on the basis of ethnicity. And so um, um, the comments sort of in general, Arabic, Persian, I prefer to stay away from such things. I think they're inappropriate. Now, having said that, I think that it's pretty clear that when we're talking about Hamas, Hamas is no trouble lying about almost everything that it does. Right? It, gives, it gives civilian casualty counts that are clearly false, and knowingly so. It talks about its behavior in knowingly false ways. It just, for example, it denied to all Western media that engaged in any civilian shielding, where it's clear from other reports from Gaza civilians, from media personnel who had rockets shot off right next to them, from doctors in hospitals, uh, etc., that they're engaging in civilian shielding everywhere. Right? So what do you do when, um, when they lie? And the, 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 I, I think that that's the wrong question. And I'll tell you why it's the wrong question. Because I think most people involved in this actually know that Hamas is lying. The real question is, what do you do to convince uh, media outlets to treat these as lies? What do you do to convince the UN to treat it as a lie? So, for example, the UN has endorsed Palestinian ministry, health ministry fi casualty figures that are clearly false. Now, what do you do to convince them to do otherwise? And I unfortunately don't have an answer. That if, I were, if I were UN personnel stationed in Gaza, it would be much more important to me to do what Hamas wants than what Israel wants. Because Hamas will kill me, and Israel won't. Right? That's, that's an important thing in figuring out what to do. Now, second of all, if I come out with these figures, my promotion in the UN uh, uh, command is not going to be at all uh, compromised by having promoted the agenda of Hamas. If I do the opposite, if I promote agenda of Israel, it's actually it's going to significantly hurt my chances of professional advancement. And so it's a problem with uh, the UN. What do you do for media personnel? Well, for media personnel, there, the, what it's a problem. No, it's a problem to be exposed as having given a deliberately false report. On the other hand, cases in which Israel has not acceded to an international convention, one with one with Geneva Conventions and the other with International Criminal Court Treaty. Yes. And I wasn't quite clear on whether it would be more advantageous for Israel to accede or not, and what, how it would change Israel's position, not only from a legal point of view, what proceedings might be possible then, which are now, uh, but also from the point of view of appearances, uh, of um, identification with international law, uh, how that might change Israel's standing 
vis-à-vis the situation today. Right, so the, 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 the Okay. So the question was um, about the several conventions that I mentioned to which Israel is not a party. Um, should Israel be a party to, to them? How would that affect Israel's standing under international law? And also, how would it affect the perception of Israel? Correct? Okay. Um, now, the conventions that I refer to, which, which Israel is not a party, are Protocols 1 and 2 additional to the Geneva Conventions. There are seven Geneva Conventions. There's the first four to which Israel is a party, and there are three additional protocols. Israel is a party to the third one, but not to the first two. Now, the reason Israel is not a party to the first two is the same reason that the United States is not a party to the first two, which is that both were perceived as granting rights in an unwarranted fashion to uh, groups that disobey the rules of war. Right? It basically made an asymmetric situation in which um, a group's fighters can violate the rules of war and still enjoy the status of being a legitimate prisoner of war, for example. Um, um, now, when we talk about is it worthwhile or not worthwhile for Israel to join items like this, now, the other one that I mentioned was the International Criminal Court. Um, we have to recognize, first of all, that because Israel actually imposes upon itself the requirements of international law, um, by becoming a party to any particular convention, it's essentially going to be binding itself in the future. Now, formally speaking, Israel's, Israel only incorporates into domestic law customary international law, not, con not treaty international law. But uh, the Supreme Court tends to ignore that and impose upon Israel treaty law anyway, um, through a variety of means. And what that means is that Israel is accepting upon itself different duties. Now, is it a worthwhile thing for Israel to accept upon itself these different duties? Um, so now we can ask about the substance of it. Is it a worthwhile thing for Israel to grant prisoner of war status to fighting groups that deliberately violate the rules of war? I can think of a number of reasons why not. Um, but, you know, you can argue about it. Um, when you're talking about the International Criminal Court, what you're talking about is not a question of the substantive rules that go with it. What you're talking about is empowering a particular body to enforce these rules. Right? Because uh, for the most part, uh, there's little disagreement about the rules themselves. Um, now, is it a worthwhile thing for Israel to embody, to, for, to empower this particular group to judge it? Um, the record suggests a little skepticism. Um, now, there's always, a, there's always a last question, which is, well, maybe Israel should pay the price anyway in order to improve its image as law-abiding. Right? Now, um, I tend to think that the image that Israel has as a law-abiding and non-law-abiding state has absolutely nothing to do with the facts, as you can see, for example, in the recent war. I, I, it's, it's really, really, really difficult to put together a case saying that Israel did not abide by the law. It's really, really, really easy to put together a case that Hamas did not abide by the law. Nonetheless, it, I can't find any... If you, for example, go to Human Rights Watch and look at the, their documents that were issued throughout the war, I can't find a single one that was devoted to discussing Hamas violations. Every single one is devoted to addressing alleged Israeli violations. And on some of the most dubious theories I've ever heard. Some cases, in some cases, based on real theories, but based on dubious facts. Um, so, the, what is the, the incremental inv advantage of creating this image um, against the background uh, that, that we see? I'm not sure. I, I tend to also to be skeptical um, that it's worth making this sacrifice because I don't see a tremendously improving image. But maybe I'm wrong. Yeah. Wait, wait, is there somebody that I we had? Yes. Um, my question here, again, given that you're expert, Howard Weisband, that your expertise is in the law, and, yes. and I appreciate that. Yes. My question really relates to the law, but to what extent does it recognize media reports, or might it rec recognize media reports? And I'm tying it in to what you said, that we handled the media somewhat clumsily, 
when I listen to reports after the war, when, when um, or at the tail end, when media was allowed to enter, and I listen to some CNN, and I listen to some 60 Minutes, CBS, and uh, they're all, you know, reports of alleged crimes. Uh, I wonder if they had been there, to what extent were there cases that were prosecuted? Would the courts acknowledge the, those media reports if they were more objective on site? And my, and, and then my question is: To what extent was it an anomaly, or was it a paradigm, meaning Janine? Uh, I know it's in the West Bank in Yehuda Shamron, as opposed to Aza, and and where Hamas doesn't have as much control. But clearly, the media reports that came out after the fighting in Janine showed that the numbers weren't near as high as what would have been reported. To what extent is that a paradigm versus an anomaly? Right, um, I actually, I'd like to think of a different example, and, and, and I'll tell you why in a moment. Okay, so Israel had a policy throughout this war of trying to keep most media personnel away from the fighting. Um, and this was, I think, it, well, it, it explicitly was a reaction to what happened in Lebanon. Um, I think it was an overreaction, but that's a, a, a different question. It was a reaction to, in Lebanon, there were, their media personnel were basically un, unrestricted, and Israel found them in difficult spots to manage, because you would engage in, in a combat action, and all of a sudden their media personnel running around, and maybe you can't shoot anymore, right? because somebody will be in your line of fire. Now, that's, that's the, that was the Israeli decision, but what interests me more is the, the, the question that you're raising. Would the reporting be very much different if Israel had followed the Lebanon model rather than the Gaza model? And I think the question answers itself, because if you look at the Lebanon reporting, I, it was as abysmal as could be. It was um, it the 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 Lebanon reporting tended also to fo to follow the Hezbollah line. Um, the Lebanon reporting was also full of these accusations of war crimes that had neither facts nor law behind them. Um, and so, if you ask, would Israel have been better off following the Lebanese the the Lebanon war model, at least as far as? The, me the outcome of the media reports, I think they would be the same. At least that's what, the, that's what these two experiences tell me. Now, should Israel have allowed more access? I think it should have anyway, but that has nothing to do with um, whether it would have, as a result, gotten better coverage. I think that it would have gotten exactly the same abysmal coverage. What, what about the defensive shield model, though? What, what happened with Janine? And I, I think that in Janine, the reports turned after Israel actually restricted access. If you recall what happened there, um, there were reports of Janine, uh, coming out of Janine of various massacres uh, carried out by Israelis. Um, the UN uh, um, wanted to dispatch, there was the Human Rights Council, wanted to dispatch a fact-finding mission um, to uh, determine Israel's guilt in uh, committing these non-existent massacres, um, and Israel refused to cooperate, and, uh, and they never took off. They never landed here, um, and that's when, at, at that point, media reports started coming out to the contrary. Right. Um, and I actually think that there's, if you look at the Janine model, it actually suggests that there, um, <clears throat> there's something to questioning the objectivity of reporters that may induce them to, um, to improve their reporting. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, what's, what's, what's the Larry Waxman. Larry Waxman. I have a question which I, I, I don't think there's an answer to. Every day, when one listens to the news, there's people are bandying, bandying around the expression, you're in violation of international law, this is what is in violation of international law, you're in violation of international law. And I've never heard a reporter turn around and say, which law would that be? Because anyone can say in violation of international law, and nobody, nobody seems to care, is there such a law? Does it exist? What are you talking about? Is, do you have any comment on that? 
Yeah, that's why I try to actually stick to the rules. <laughs> and I, I, I agree that there's a lot of loose talk out there, and I think that my response is I'd rather not engage in loose talk and stick to what. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I, there's there's a, a whole lot of material out there that just says um, Israel's committed mass war crimes, and how do you address that? You can't really, because there's nothing there. What what are you supposed to say to it? Yeah. Do you think, what's the likelihood of someone in Israel being tried in court for a war crime? And if so, how does that play out? And I'm a little confused about what Spain did, and if you can try someone in absentia, what does that all mean? Okay, um, what is the likelihood of someone in Israel being uh, tried for war crimes? It happens all the time, and um, Israelis who commit war crimes are very likely to be court-martialed and may be prosecuted in civil courts. Um, the, what's the likelihood of Palestinians who commit war crimes being prosecuted? Somewhat low. Okay, it's actually, especially when you get to the the big fish, it's very rare. It takes a political decision, and um, for the most part, these political decisions are not there. Um, now, about Spain, the way um, the way the Spanish system works at least as far as this is concerned, is that Spanish courts are interrogational, which means that the judge can decide to investigate something. He gets a petition, decides to investigate something, and then may or may not decide to proceed with it. And at this point, a Spanish judge was asked to and decided to investigate a claim that Israel committed war crimes, not in this action, but um, seven years ago, when it attacked a terrorist named Shade, and um, it, it attacked him in his home, and um, as a result of the bombing, 16 civilians died. Thirteen. Um, now, pardon? Thirteen. Thirteen civilians. Thirteen. Shade is bodyguard, and another fourteen civilians. Okay. Right. Uh, 13 civilians. Now, um, looking at the numbers, by the way, if, if I compare them again to the to the TV and radio station that was clearly not disproportionate for the prosecutor at ICTI, you know, I don't know, I don't even understand how one can allege there's a crime disproportionality, but the, the Spanish judge decided there was enough there to go on in the investigation. Now, what does that mean? What that means is that they would issue warrants for arrest for all of these people and put them out in Interpol. Now, for example, the uh, Pinochet case went like that, that the judge decided that Pinochet should be prosecuted, issued a warrant, went, sent it to Interpol, that went to the Brits. The Brits then decided to honor the warrant and try to arrest Pinochet in Brit on British soil so that the Sp this Spanish court could do the same thing, issue warrants for all these various senior Israeli figures on the basis of this alleged crime, and then uh, depending on whether it's a, uh, do who the state is and what they want to do with it, they may decide to arrest or issue arrest warrants themselves or try to arrest uh, Israelis who are present there. Um, if there's nothing else, then I will thank you very much, and I'll be available here afterwards. Thank you.